In Praise of Pip, starring Fred Willard with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcheson and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Chad Reinhardt, Christopher Bolf, David Darlow, Linda Ryder, Jeff Lupatin, Peter DeFaria, Doug James, Joby Cerny, Kurt Nabig, Anna Savrutza, Jason Mallow, Carl Amari, and Amanda Amari. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. This is far enough. Hold up, men! Looks like we're in the clear, Sarge. Don't believe everything you see. Want me to call base camp? Not yet. Oh, my aching back. <sighs> you can say that again. On your feet, Private. Oh, well, we got a real nice spot here. Nobody told you to fall out. You mean we ain't gonna have a picnic? Pick up your gear. Now. Yeah, yeah. Listen up, you jokers. This isn't war games. You want to get home in one piece, you follow orders, or you can lay down and die right now. You got that? Sergeant? What is it, Phillips? I can do some recon if you want. Check out the river? Not now. If it's all clear, maybe we could cross... Forget it, Pip. I need you here. But, Lieutenant, base is only a few clicks away. If Charlie's behind us... Charlie's close. I can feel him. And you've been here as long as I have. You'll feel him, too. Listen to the Sergeant. He eats and he sleeps jungle. He lives in the trees like a monkey. He was made for this. You... Well, you're a bunch of city boys. You don't know Jack. Now cut the chatter. I was thinking. Yeah? Maybe the kid has a point. If the river's secure, we could cross and make a circle back to camp. If it's secure. That's a big if. Only one way to be sure. He's too great. That's just it. He's fresh off the boat and he knows it. So he follows orders. Tell him to cut a path to the river and come straight back. He'll do it. He won't mess around. Just one man. If he stays low, keeps moving, it might work. Give him ten minutes. If he's not back, we move out. Pip? Sir? I want you to come down there. I want you to turn mm -hmm. down the line, In the river? Okay. okay. All right. Now get moving. Yes, sir. Now where's he going? Yeah, he's in a mighty big hurry. That's probably the chow we ate. No, he's gonna have himself a little swim. Hope we took his suntan lotion. Cool it! Come on, Phillips. You can do it. Pip? Pip? Pip! Pip? Pip! Yeah, I'll be right there, Mrs. Feeney. I, I was just resting my eyes. I must have been dreaming some nightmare. Mr. Phillips, are you in there? Uh, sure, Mrs. Feeney. <coughs> just let me get the locks on the door. Hey, you got a message for me from Pip? Quick transition from a war zone in Southeast Asia to a rooming house stateside. That's the way the mind works, moving through time and space as if they were the elements of a dream. Only sometimes, the dream may not go away quite so easily. Submitted for your approval, one Max Phillips, age 46, slightly the worse for wear, whose life so far has been as drab and undistinguished as a bundle of dirty clothes. Occupation, small-time bookmaker. 
And though it's a bit late in his career, he has an errant wish that the rest of his life might be sent out to a laundry and come back shining and clean. This to be a gift of love for a son with the unlikely name of Pip, Mr. Max Phillips, who is soon to discover that a man may not be as wise as he thinks. Said lesson to be learned the hard way in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story in praise of Pip, starring Fred Willard with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Mr. Phillips, I can't wait all day. Oh, sorry, Mrs. Feeney. What do you got for me? A message from Pip? Afraid not. Oh. Well, come on in. I must have fell asleep. You ever take naps? I started taking them lately. It makes you feel refreshed. <laughs> Besides, I ain't getting any younger. Hmm. Smells like a brewery in here. Nice, huh? Nice? No. Typical, yes. Pour you one? I didn't come here to socialize. Oh, oh, sure. Well, uh, <laughs> is it about the rent? Because I'm pretty sure I paid it. Check your book. You'll see that I... You got a visitor downstairs. I do? Some kid. That right. What's his name? I didn't ask. Well, uh, tell him to wait a couple of minutes. I already did. You did? Then I better straighten up. Yeah, you better. I think he's got some more business for you. No kidding. You're a doll, Mrs. Feeney. Did I ever tell you I love you? All the time. Speaking of which, do you know what time it is now? Uh, sure. Sure I do. Only first, tell me what day it is. It's eight o'clock. In the evening. What? It can't be. Well, it is. September the 13th, 1963. And you look like an x-ray of an ulcer. Anything else you want to know? Yeah, where's a clean shirt? Lower right-hand drawer. You got one left. Thanks. You know I'm crazy about you. You're the queen of women. Mailman come yet? Come and gone. <sighs> Anything for me? Nope. Nothing from my boy, huh? You ask me that every day. Well, sometimes he writes, when he's got time. He must be awfully busy over there. Place called Vietnam. Don't worry about him. He's a good boy. He'll be all right. He better be. Look at him in this picture. I ever show you his picture? Every time I come up here. Just look at him in his uniform. Takes after his dad, don't you think? You want me to throw away these empty bottles? Would you? That'd be great. You ain't doing yourself any good living this way. You know that. A very astute observation, Mrs. Finney. That's why I'm crazy about you. I love your <coughs> astute observations. <laughs> I mean it. I know you do. <laughs> ah, there, good as new. Take a look in the mirror, would you? Who's that good-looking man? Why, it must be Max Phillips, purveyor of tickets of chance on equestrian events. Take my advice. Find yourself a new line of work. Well, now, here's an observation of my own, Mrs. Feeney. One of these days, I'm going to drink my last drink, accept my last bet, perform my final con, and then I'll be ready to go out and meet Pip when he comes back. And you know what I'm going to tell him? I'm going to tell him that his old man finally wised up. And when will that great day happen? Oh, one of these days. That's what they'll put on your gravestone. Mr. Max, one of these days, Phillips. It's kind of a pity, you know. You're not such a bad guy. And you are the paragon of all virtue. I'm nuts about you, Mrs. Feeney. Let's dance. Keep your hands to yourself now. And then later, you and I can toast marshmallows together and sing camp songs. How about it, Mrs. Feeney? <laughs> It'll be to laugh, won't it? Won't it be to laugh? I'll send up your visitor. Isn't it? George. 
Georgie, that's right. Hello, Mr. Phillips. Please, step into my office. Thanks. Drink? I've got a bottle. Uh, no thanks, Mr. Phillips. How about a cigarette? I've already got one. Oh, you got two by any chance? Oh, yeah, sure. Thanks, kid. I just ran out. <sighs> there, that's better. Well, Georgie, what can I do you for? Another bet? Uh, Mr. Phillips, Shady Boy lost yesterday. Hmm, he sure did. That's the way of the world, Georgie. The rich get richer and the long shots lose. So what's to do? But you told me he had a good chance. Did I? Well, see, the thing of it is, though, it rained yesterday. It tears up the turf pretty bad. You said he ran good on a wet track. I said that? Yes, sir. Proving how little I know about handicapping. Now look, Mr. Phillips... What, George? Uh, sure you don't want to drink just a little one? Look, I, I bet every nickel I had on him. Ah, oh, that's a real shame. What am I going to do? I give up. What? Well, I was hoping, uh, you know, maybe we could work something out. Like what? You know, George, it's funny, but I, I can't think of a single thing. Can you? It's funny, all right. Just a big joke to you, huh? Lots of laughs. Where'd you get the money, George? Uh, what do you care? I am serious. Where'd it come from? Doesn't matter. I, I got it, all right? You borrowed it? Sort of. From where? The place where I work, all right? The place where you work? An office. A white-collar crime, huh? I told you, I only borrowed it. Sure you borrowed it, without anybody knowing that you borrowed it. How right am I? So what happens now? What do you think happens? I'll go to jail. Now that I'll make book on. Mm. Poor Georgie Porgy, one of the new breed. A Johnny come lately brains right out of college in a second guesser head. What a shame. So I ask you again, Georgie, what's to do? Well, that's why I came to see you. I have to put the money back by tomorrow morning. If I don't, they'll know I did it. Make a note of this, George. I'm about to slip you a real tip. Guaranteed the truth of the day. What's that? My name is Max Phillips. I'm a bookie. That's my profession. I accept wagers and give out ticket stubs on horses. I do not accept sad stories and give out advice. Comprende? Yeah. However... I will loosen up this much. I will go so far as to remind you of the following. If you're dumb enough to bet on horses, not to mention dumb enough to steal the money you're betting, then, young George, you happen to be up the proverbial creek without the proverbial paddle. Well, maybe guys like me wouldn't be that dumb if guys like you didn't make it so easy. Let me get this straight. I made it easy for you. Supply and demand, buddy. As long as there are people like you, there'll be guys like me. Get it? Maybe so. But you laid on a pretty good story how easy it'll be. I've never done this before. How was I to know? How old are you? Nineteen. My kid's nineteen. See that picture over there in the dresser? He's a lot like you, but he's got smarts. He wouldn't bet that twelve o'clock was midnight. Good for him. Here. What's this? Your dough, all of it. But how, how can... I didn't even send it over to Moran. You want to know why? Mr. Phillips... It... I'll tell you why. Two reasons. One, I have fleeced 12 kids like you this week. Cleaned them out and left them to bleach. You'd make number 13. I'm superstitious. And the other reason, that boy in the picture there, if he ever did anything as dumb as you, I'd count it as a favor if somebody straightened him out. So, why didn't you run along now before I change my mind? Man, Mr. Phillips, what about... what about Moran? You're referring to the gentleman who employs me. What'll he say? I, mean, I hear he's a pretty tough character. Oh, wrong. He's an angel, a kindly sensitive man. Salt of the earth. If he finds out that you gave me back my money, he'll say it was a welch. Oh, no doubt. But it'll be my problem, not yours. Thanks, Mr. Phillips. Thanks a lot. Let me tell you something, George. You can welch on a bet. That's SOP. But don't get like me. Don't welch on your soul. Then you wind up hating what you see in the mirror, and that can make it rough when you shave. Good night, Mr. Phillips. Good night, Georgie Porgy. Sleep tight. You saved my life. God bless you. 
This one's for you, Pip. Oh, and Pip, can you hear me, son? Please take care of yourself. Take real good care. More wounded? I'm afraid so, sir. And more on the way. You know we can't handle any more, Lieutenant. I filled up every cot I can lay my hands on. You'll just have to do the best you can. But we can't keep up with all the casualties. Better than sending them home in body bags. Thank God help them. This one on the stretcher, the boy from Huang Ho? That's right, sir. Man, we were caught in an ambush. Multiple shrapnel wounds, abdomen, extensive tissue damage. Not a pretty sight. Can you do anything for him? Shot of morphine. Other than that, we can't touch him here. This is only a field hospital. The kind of surgery he needs. Level with me, Doc. What are his chances? Not very good. Oh, that's tough. He's a good kid. Phillips Pip. Hm. It's an odd name. It's what everybody called him. Well, Private Pip, I wish you a full recovery and a long life. For sure to that, someone to mourn you. Dad? Dad, I need you. Help me. Ice cream, cotton candy, salt water taffy. How about you, mister? Me? Oh, no, no, I don't eat that stuff. My boy, though, my boy used to like ice cream cones when he was little, the kind with nuts. That yeah, right. Ice cream, cotton candy. Hey, give me an ice cream, huh? For old time's sake. Make sure it's got lots of nuts on it, okay, pal? Suit yourself. Here you go. Get your ice creams right here. Mmm. Ah. Tastes good. Don't it, though? Hey, Vinny, what are you doing here? Looking for you. What do you think? Some other time, Vinny, I'm going for a stroll. Eating an ice cream cone. You know how it is. Yeah? Nice time of day. The weather's cooling down. I don't need any company. Maybe you don't. But Mr. Moran, he wants to see you. Oh, does he? Would you just tell Mr. Moran that I'll be around tomorrow with his dough? No reason to worry. He knows where I live. He wants to see you now. No kidding. Let's go. Two grand, two twenty, two thirty. Yeah. Max Phillips is here, boss. Showman. This way. I know the way. How long have I been coming here, Vinny? Shut the door and wait here in case I need you. Sure, boss. In case you need him, that's a laugh. Might need protection, huh? Against me? Sit down. That's all right. I won't be staying long. I got another engagement. So, oh, Max, haven't seen you in five days. I know, seems like years. Where is everybody? Everybody was here. Now, they're gone. That a fact. We settled accounts tonight. Oh, yeah. Where were you? A reasonable question. That's me. Always reasonable. I must have took the wrong bus. You don't need to take a bus. It's two blocks. Well, how about, it was such a beautiful day, and I thought I'd take a stroll on the boardwalk. Hey, you remember those ice cream cones with chocolate and nuts on the outside? Guess what? They still make them. I must have bought my kid a million of those. I must have... Enough already. You give me the wrong story now, and you'll end up under a bus instead of on one. That could be messy, if you catch my drift. Oh, I catch it all right. Here you go, Moran. Catch this. Thirteen hundred and forty-one dollars. Not bad, huh? Things are looking up. That depends on who's doing the looking. From where I sit, I don't like the view. Then maybe you should clean your glasses. Max, Max, Max. What am I going to do with you? What am I going to do with you? Smoke? Sure, thanks. I, I don't understand you, Maxie. Don't worry about it. I don't understand myself sometimes. But you know, I don't worry about it anymore. I just take it the way it comes. That's my motto now. I treat you like a favorite uncle, and then what do you do? You double-cross me. Me? 
I don't see nobody else here, do you? I don't know what you're talking about. No? Kid by the name of George Reynolds placed a bet with you, 300 bucks. His horse didn't place. But somehow, the dough never got to me. Uh-oh, busted. Why, Maxie? I'll bite. Why? Vinny. Something, boss? Bring the kid in now. Sure thing. I want you to see what happened. See what? You, you mean he's here? No, he's taking a vacation in Miami Beach. Of course he's here. Nobody gets past me. No, because you gave it back. You welched on me. I had to go out and find the kid and get my money. My money, Max. But he got stubborn, so I had to rough him up. That was a lot of trouble to go through. Sit down in the chair. All right, I'm sitting. Oh. Yeah, looks like an awful lot of trouble. For me and him both. And you did this for 300 lousy dollars? A little attitude adjustment. Please, Mr. Phillips, don't let him hit me anymore. All right, I get the point. Let him go. No can do, Maxie. You know what happened if I give him a free pass? This would be the first of a long line. And inside of three months, I wouldn't have a shirt on my back. The kid must have persuaded you pretty good. He didn't do anything. Just place the bed, ask him. Look at his face. He's already been asked. Nice black eye, if I do say so. One I should make it a pair, boss. If I don't put the money back, I'll go to jail. Don't you understand, Mr. Moran? I'll go to jail. Well, you're tearing me to pieces, kid. It's me right here. You know what your trouble is? You listen to people like Maxie. That's mistake number one. He never gave anything away in his life. How right am I, Maxie? Very right. Guess I'm just a heel with a Robin Hood complex. <laughs> He's got a complex. But a short-lived one, Georgie Porgy. Remember that. Next time somebody hands you something for free, consider the source. Nothing from nothing equals nothing. You want I should answer it, boss? No, I want you to eat it. Get it for me. It's giving me a migraine. Talk to me. Who? Yeah. Uh, he's busy right now. All right, all right, I'll tell him. It's your landlady. Mrs. Feeney? Says there's a telegram for you. A telegram? Probably from Georgie's horse. Saying he's just coming into the stretch and he'll be home for Easter. Give me that. Yeah? Well, open it up, would you, Mrs. Feeney? From the Defense Department? Go ahead, read it to me. Thank you, Mrs. Feeney. No, no, I'm all right. Thank you. What did it say? Pip's been wounded. My son is dying in, in a hospital somewhere, a place called Laos. There isn't even supposed to be a war there, but my kid is dying. It's to laugh. I swear it's to laugh. Hey, Maxie, that's, that's a tough break. Yeah. I'm real sorry to hear it. See that amusement park down there? My kid loved to go to amusement parks. That one especially. I used to take him on Saturday nights. Just the two of us. Like tonight. This is a Saturday. Oh. Oh, look. He ain't dead yet. I wouldn't, what I mean is he... You know, when I wasn't too drunk, or when I wasn't out conning somebody for you, Moran, I'd take him to the amusement park and we'd have a ball. Take it easy, huh? You know, Moran, I think you're wrong. I think I have given something away. And you know what it was? My son Pip. The good part of me. The clean part. The only part I was proud of. Give me that envelope. What are you doing? Take your money, Georgie. Put it back where it came from Monday morning. Nobody will be the wiser, except you. Thanks, Mr. Phillips. I hope you learned something. Now get going. If, if you say so. Hold it right there. Don't listen to him. Look, Max, I'm sorry about your kid and all, but that don't give you no call to... Moran, no more from you. No more. Twenty years ago, I should have spat in your eye. I don't know why I didn't. Twenty years. I should have remembered a little time a man has to raise his son. The honor goes to you now, George. It's a little belated, but it's the best I can do. Just a minute. Go ahead and get out of here while you can. Walk fast, and don't stop, no matter what. I'll never forget this, Mr. Phillips. You ain't going nowhere. 
Yeah, he is. Who says so? This. What's that? Are you crazy? You pull a knife in here? In my place? Tell your man to take his hand out of his pocket. If he's reaching for a cigarette, tell him the smoke's starting to bother me. But if he's reaching for anything else, tell him I'll cut his heart out before he gets his hand out of his coat, and then I'll go to work on you. Don't listen to him, Vinny. Do it. With pleasure. No, you don't! How do you like that? How do you like this, you cheap punk? Boss, he... He stuck me. You're nuts, Max. I'm getting out of here. Not so fast. Let go of me. Okay, as soon as they make sure you're not getting up. Mr. Phillips, your stomach, you're bleeding. Get lost, Georgie. Get lost fast and don't look back. Can't get my breath. Now I'm having trouble seeing and hearing. What's going on? Maybe it's too late. I was gonna change, that's a fact. I was gonna change. No more bets, no more bottles. And I was gonna meet Pip when he got off the boat. So now there's no more bets, no more bottles. <laughs> but there's no more Pip either. Best laid plans of mice and men and me. God, if I could only see him, if I could only talk to him, if I could only tell him, Pip! Pip, where are you? Where? Sutures? Yes, Doctor. How's his blood pressure? Holding. But if it drops any lower... Reduce the anesthetic. Yes, sir. I'm almost out. As soon as I finish, move him to IC. I'll tell them to prepare a bed. All right, my friends. That'll have to do. There's still some shrapnel in the abdominal cavity. We may have to go back in, but this boy can't take any more today. His heart's strong. Good. That's good. I can close for you. Thank you, Doctor. Oh, and Nurse? Yes? Watch him closely. It's still touch and go. See if he survives the next hour. If he can hang on for that long, he might just make it home. You know, he might. He's young. Well, good luck to... What's his name? They call him Pip. Then good luck to you, Pip. Godspeed. Why'd they shut this place down? It's early. Isn't anybody here to sell tickets? Wait a minute. Who's that? It can't be. Hi, Pop. Pip? Hey, Pip! Hurry up. What? What are you... You slowpoke, what took you so long? Pip, I can't believe it. Where were you? I've been waiting a long time. Pip, is it really you? Your hair, your face, let me touch you. Aw, uh, quit with the mushy stuff, okay? Hey, Pip, you still got your freckles, but how, how old are you? Ten, what do you think? How, uh... How oh, come, Pip? How can you be? That's what I am, Pop. I'm ten years old. It's Saturday night. I knew you said to meet you on the boardwalk. I was worried you wouldn't come. Pip, I don't understand. Explain it to me, will you? Well, sometimes you don't show up, Pop. Sometimes you're sick or something. Yeah. Sometimes I'm... Yeah. Yeah, sometimes I am. Hey! Pip, remember what I used to say to you? I used to say... Hey, Pip, who's your best buddy? Yeah. Atta boy, let me see that smile. You always had the greatest smile. Hey, Pop, you know something? You're my best buddy. That I am, Pip. That I am. From now on, you can count on it. Hey, hey! So what do we do first? Well, how about some rides and some cotton candy? Sure, anything you want, anything at all, Pip. Just like old times, but... You're ten years old again. How can that be? Don't worry, Pop. We're here. And we're together. And we can go on some rides. Sure we can. Sure we can, Pip. Only... 
Looks like they shut the place down. The lights, the rides, everything. I got an idea. We can go someplace else. We don't have to. Take a look, Pop. It's just like it used to be. Why, you're right, Pip. How'd you do that? I didn't do anything. Come on. Sure. Sure, Pip. Let's go. We'll ride the roller coaster, the Ferris wheel, everything they got. I can go slow if you need me to. What's the matter? Don't think your old pop can keep up? Well, you keep holding your stomach. It looks like you're bleeding. Ah, oh, no, I'm not bleeding. It's, uh, it's soda. That's all it is. I spilled it on my shirt. Come on, let's get going. Let's have some fun. Ice cream, cotton candy. Can I have some cotton candy, Pop? Of course you can. One cotton candy, please. There you go. Hey, you got ice cream too? The kind with chocolate and nuts on it? You used to like that, didn't you, Pip? Mm-hmm. Make it one of each. You got it. Ice cream, cotton candy. Let's go on the Ferris wheel. Look down there, Pip. What a sight, huh? You can see the whole boardwalk from up here. Yeah. Whoa! Hold on, Pip. This is one fast roller coaster. Faster. I want to go faster. That was a good hot dog. The best. Hey, Pip, I got a question for you. What? Who's your best buddy? You are. That's right. <laughs> That's right, Pip. I always have been and I always will be. Don't ever forget it, no matter what. All right? Oh, all right. Hey, slow down. What's the big rush? I gotta go. Go where? What's the matter? There's not much more time, Pop. Sure, sure there is. What are you talking about? There's... Pip? Where'd you go? What's happening? Gotta keep up. Oh. Where'd he go? Pip. Pip, don't go in there, okay? It's a hall of mirrors. You'll get lost. Going in, mister? What? Uh, no, no. Come on. It's fun. Uh, I know. Screwy Louie's room. Mirrors all over the place. I've been in there lots of times. Pip! Pip! Yeah, better go get him. Here. Here's a ticket. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Pip! Wait up! Pip? Pip, please, what's the matter? Did I do something? It's late, Pop. What do you mean? There you are. Hold up, Pip. I want to tell you something. Ah! Oh, didn't see the glass. I thought you were... Is that you, Pip? Or a reflection? Dad? Where are you? Where'd you go? I can't find you. Where are you, Dad? It doesn't matter. Pip, you have to understand. You have to listen to me and understand. All those times... All those times I wasn't around when I was out doing business, when I was running a con, when I was drunk, when I dragged you from one rooming house to another... It doesn't make any difference now. It does make a difference. It makes a difference because I want you to know that no man... Listen to me, son. No man ever loved a boy any more than I loved you. Do you hear me? All that stuff, it was... Because I was weak. Because I was always dreaming instead of doing. I always wished. But I never tried hard enough. Pip, as God is my witness, I loved you. I have to go, Pop. No. Pip! Pip, you can't leave me now. You, you can't just go away. All these mirrors. I only had an hour, Pop. But why? Because I don't belong here. The hour's up. And it's time to die. What? Not you, Pip. You're just a kid, a little boy. Bye, Pop. You can't die, Pip. There's too much I have to tell you. Too much I have to make up to you. I want to spend the rest of my life being your dad. That's all I have to live for now. Nothing else means anything. Pip, come back. I promise no more bottles, no more lousy, crooked jobs, understand? 
No more waiting for when I don't show up. No more lies. Come out of the mirrors and let me see you. Stop hiding from me. Which one, Pip? Which one is really you? I can't, Pop. I'm sorry, but I have to go back. Hey, God. Hey, God, I'll make you a deal. I give you... I give you the carcass of a weak old idiot. I give you me. All you have to do is give Pip back. Please, God, don't take my boy. Don't take Pip. Take me. Get your ice cream and cat candy. Tickets right here for all the rides. How many, little lady? Lots. Give us a stack of tickets, will you, please? My daughter loves the rides. Sure thing. Thank you. There. Now, sweetie, which one do you want to go on first? Um, the Ferris wheel. Are you sure? That's a mighty tall ride for such a little girl. Oh, please. Oh, all right. You run ahead and get in line. I'll be right there. Yeah! Hi, Mrs. Feeney. Oh, Pip. How are you feeling today? Fine. Just fine. I won't need this cane much longer. Good. I was so sorry about your... your injury. But at least you came back to us in one piece. That I did. <laughs> Even got a purple heart out of it. That's nothing special, though. Oh, you look so handsome in your uniform. Thanks. See you back at the rooming house for dinner? Sure will. I'm coming! That little leprechaun wants to ride the Ferris wheel. Would you like to go with us? No, I think I'd just like to walk around. It's a beautiful day. Your father, God rest his soul, used to love taking you here. He talked about it all the time. I remember. We had some good times. We had some wonderful times. Mom! Well, maybe I'll see you when we get off the Ferris wheel. Sure. Have a good time. Hey, Pop, you know something? You're my best buddy. You always were. Very little comment here, save for this small aside. That the ties of the flesh are deep and strong. That the capacity to love is a vital, rich, and all-consuming function of the human animal. And that you can find nobility and sacrifice and love wherever you seek it out. Down the block, in the heart, or in the twilight zone. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. There, nice and creamy. Anthony? Hi, Aunt Amy. I just knew that was you. What's that in your hand? My jack-in-the-box. Oh, yes. That's such a funny toy. Where's my mother? In the bedroom, lying down. She'll cook the rest of the dinner as soon as I'm finished. But I wanted to get this done first. What you making? Well, what do you think? A cake, of course. For my favorite little boy. Is it a good one? Oh, yes. A very good one. Very, very good. I just took it out of the oven a while ago. Chocolate on the inside with little yellow swirls? What else? I know what my Anthony wants. See? Doesn't that smell good? Where's the frosting? Right here in the bowl. It's chocolate, too. I blended in a lot of butter to make sure it's smooth. One hundred times by hand. Milk? Chocolate? You bet. 
We don't like that dark chocolate, do we? Ugh. No, no. Hurry up, Aunt Amy. Don't you worry. It'll be ready in a jiffy. Put the frosting on. Plenty of time for that. Besides, we have to let the cake cool first. Put it on now. Oh, I know what you want. You want to lick the bowl. Well, you'll just have to wait. I don't want to wait. Be a good boy now. I am a good boy. I know you are. <laughs> I know that. Of course I do. A very, very good boy. I'll just go ahead and frost it now. Why not? No problem, Anthony. None at all. I want lots on the top. Surely, lots and lots. See how thick I'm putting it on? Swirls of chocolate butter frosting, and all of it for my favorite nephew. There. Some more around the sides. We don't want to forget the sides, do we, Anthony? The sides are good too. So good. Mmm. Anthony, stop that! Get your finger out of the bowl. Ow! There'll be plenty left for you to lick when I'm finished. When I'm. I mean, when I. You hit me. Oh, I didn't hit you. I barely touched your hand. You're a big boy, aren't you? That hurt. Why? It didn't. I only meant for you to to wait till I've finished frosting the cake. Then I'll give you the entire bowl, all of it. Everything's for you. It always is. You know that, don't you, Anthony? I don't think I like you anymore. Well, I like you. I love you. You're my favorite boy in the whole wide world. I mean it. I really, truly mean it. Come and give your auntie Amy a kiss. No. Then I'll give you one. I'm going outside now. Yes. Yes, you do that. Go outside and play. Playing is good. Here, take the bowl with you. Anthony. Anthony, come back. Don't you want your frosting? You can have the whole bowl. Everything all right? Oh, Anthony. Nice day, isn't it, Amy? Very nice. Something the matter? No, nothing's the matter. Nothing at all. Did, did anything happen? Oh, I, I was just frosting the cake, and Anthony couldn't resist tasting it. Well, who could? I used to love frosting when I was his age. Didn't you? It's good, isn't it? So. Good. Why wait? We can go ahead and have the cake now if Anthony wants. It's perfectly fine with me. Now, Amy, why don't you apologize to the boy? You can do that, can't you? Anthony, I'm sorry. Come on back, boy. Anthony, please. Anthony. <laughs> Welcome to Peaksville, Ohio, on a hot July afternoon. At first glance, you'd think this is a farm like any other, and the little boy, Anthony by name, is like any other little boy. But Peaksville is a place not found on any map, and those fields of wheat and barley—they're not the only crop. Something else grows in Peaksville, and for want of a better term, we'd call it horror. One day, exactly six years ago, a boy was born, and as far as the people are concerned, that's all that matters. There isn't anything else, because Anthony controls it all. In just a moment, we'll take a closer look at Anthony Fremont and the people in the village and the village itself. A world in which nothing exists except Peaksville. A world Anthony manufactured and which he now rules with absolute power. A nightmare of rare design, located dead center in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, "It's a Good Life," starring Mike Starr with Stacy Keach as your narrator. I'll see he gets it, Amy. Would you? Don't you worry, none. Look, boy. Look what Aunt Amy's got for you. Your own bowl of chocolate frosting. You like chocolate, don't you, Anthony? 
I know I do. Chocolate's good. I don't like her. <laughs> of course you do. She's your Aunt Amy, and she loves you. You know that. I hate her. Oh, that's a good joke. <laughs> a very good joke. It's all for you, Anthony, all of it. And after you've finished, I'll make some more if you like. As much as you want. Get away. Oh, now, darling. Don't look at me. What? I don't like you to look at me. Hear that, Amy? Anthony's got a point. Why don't you go back in the house for now, so you can help Agnes cook dinner? Yes. Yes, I'll do that. It's going to be a good dinner, isn't it? I believe it will be, yes. You know, just the way he likes it. Don't you? It'll be delicious, Anthony. You'll see. I told you, don't look at me. She's not. I'll make it so she can't look at me. So she can't look at anything ever again. Watch your step there, Amy. I can't see. What do you mean? <laughs> sure you can. That would be some joke. Just go on inside. The light. That's all I can see. The sun. It's so bright. The sun blazing in the sky, like white fire all around. Amy? Help me, please. I can't see. I can't see. Help me. It's nothing, Amy. I'll help you up. Sit here in your chair. There you go. That's right. Sit. Sit and rock. You'll feel better real soon, I'm sure. It's good to rock, isn't it? Yes, it's good to sit on the porch and rock. There, there now. <laughs> Hi there, Bill. Afternoon, Mr. Fremont. I brought the groceries from town. Gee, that was fast. Thank you, Bill. Very thoughtful of you. My pleasure. Howdy, Anthony. Hi, Mr. Soames. Mighty good to see you today. Mighty good. It's such a good day. A real good day, isn't it, Anthony? It's terrible hot, though. Terrible hot. Oh, I wouldn't say that. Uh, no, ma'am. I wouldn't say that at all. It, it's fine. Just fine. A real good day all around. <laughs> What are you doing, Anthony? Playing. My. That's real good. Whatever it is. You like it? Sure do. I was just wondering uh, what you were doing. I made something. By golly, you did. Know what it is? I can't rightly say that I do. Take a guess. Oh, I'm not very good at guessing. Guess. Go on, Bill. You can do that, can't you? Well, uh, now, uh... Some kind of animal, is it? It's a gopher with three heads. See? Oh! Oh, yeah, yeah. He's a real fine one. Uh, I ain't never seen a gopher with three heads before. Is... I mean... He's alive, huh? Uh, must be, the way he's moving around. He was. I'll make him dead now. I'm tired of playing with him. Be dead, gopher. You be dead. Now that's real fine, Anthony. That's real fine, uh, what you done. Sure is. Yeah. Y you made him dead, all right. Uh, uh, look at him laying there. It's good that you done that. Uh, real good. Tell me what it looked like. Well, well, it was like a regular gopher, only more interesting. Was it ugly, though? Oh, I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't either. I'll bet it was ugly. Grotesque looking. That's the way Anthony likes things. <laughs> oh, what a good joke. <laughs> You'd better bury him now. Okay. Want some help? No, I'll wish him into the cornfield. You do that. Go for, go into the cornfield. Go be in the cornfield. Well, what do you know? A a a ain't that something? What are you doing here, anyway? Me? What do you mean, Anthony? Uh, I'm delivering the groceries. 
Uh, what do you think? Go ahead and do it then. Why, sure. I'm the delivery man. That's me. You better. You don't want me to wish you did, do you? W why, why, no, Anthony. No, I, I don't. But... But what? But I just wanted to say... You do some real fine things. Real fine. Uh, you're, you're, you're a good boy. We all love you. Uh, don't we, Miss Amy? Don't we just love Anthony? Oh, yes. We love him. Everybody loves Anthony. Yes, sir. We sure do love him. Uh, we love that boy. Well, hi, Bill. Mrs. Fremont, uh, how are you? I was just checking the roast in the oven. Got everything we asked for? Pretty much. I have your list here. Uh, let me see. I uh, didn't have any laundry soap. General store is all out of the laundry soap. Well, that's to be expected. Not even bar soap, though, huh? All out of that, too? Oh, we've been out for a year. You know that, Mrs. Fremont. We ain't had no bar soap for over a year, so... I guess nobody has to wash their hands or behind their ears anymore. <laughs> that's right, Bill. That's exactly right. I, I got a couple of cans of soup in there. That's nice, huh? Didn't even know we had them on the shelf. And I remembered, Anthony loves tomato soup, doesn't he? So I brought that. How thoughtful. You'll tell him, won't you, Mrs. Fremont? Tell him I brought the tomato soup because I heard he liked it. Tell him I brought it, won't you? Why, of course I will, Bill. I'll tell him. Matter of fact, I'll tell him right now. Oh, no, 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 Mrs. Fremont. You don't have to go to the trouble. I, 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 I got to get going anyway. I got to get back to the store. You don't have to be frightened of him, Bill. He likes you. He told me that several times, how much he liked you. Oh, that's that's real nice to hear. He's a, he's a clever boy, Mrs. Fremont. That he is. About the cleverest boy I've ever seen. Know what he was doing out there? Making something, I imagine. You got it. Yesterday he made a... some kind of furry animal. I have never seen the likes of it, but he invented it all by himself. Had real sharp teeth, too. Long and sharp. Could have done some real damage. It tried to bite him. I was kind of hoping that it was... Mrs. Fremont. But Anthony wished it into the cornfield. Before it could do him any harm. I gotta be going, Mrs. Fremont. I I'm real glad. I mean, it's real fine that Anthony keeps making these things. Real fine indeed. Yes, ma'am. It's great. See you tonight, won't we, Bill? Tonight? Why, sure, it's TV night tonight. Oh, yeah. Anthony's going to put pictures on the television, and we're going to have a surprise party for Dan Hollis. A real nice surprise party. I'll be there, Mrs. Fremont. You can count on me. Where? What? Nothing. Uh, bye now, Miss Amy. Uh, be sure to say goodbye to your nephew for me. I will. Where's Anthony? I think he went into the barn. Oh, leastways I heard the door open. I keep telling him he shouldn't go in there, but... Amy, why, it's real nice that Anthony goes into the barn. A real good thing. But Agnes, Agnes, he isn't even around now. You don't have to say that. But even so, Amy, even so, it's nice that he goes into the barn when he wants to. It's real nice. He mustn't even think anything bad about him, Amy. Do you understand? But he isn't around. Amy, dear, you know as well as I do, sometimes he can... He can hear what we're thinking, no matter where he is. He doesn't even have to hear it with his ears. It's like when you lost your temper. That was only for a second. One second. I know, but look what he did to your eyes. Now you can't even see. So you just think nice things, Amy. Real nice things about how good it is that Anthony's going into the barn to, to do whatever he does in there. And tonight, tonight we'll have Dan Hollis's birthday party and we'll have a nice time. A very nice time. But it's such a hot day. I hope it cools off tonight. Oh, I wouldn't say it was hot, Amy. It's just right. It's a good day. Don't you think so, too? A real good day. Who's... Oh. 
it's you, Agnes. What are you doing? Thought I'd lie down and try to rest before dinner. Oh, that's a good idea. You worked hard today. Always do. Got to get the crops in. Come in, honey, if you want. And close the door. He's still playing outside. Good. That's good. I put Amy to bed in her room. Did you? I had to lead the way. Is there a cane in the house, do you remember? She's going to need one. I'll sure check. I told her to try and take a nap. Good. Jeff. Naps are great this time of day, don't you think? Yes, yes I do. I wanted to talk to you about... Sure, honey. We can talk all you want. Later. I was just going to change my clothes. Why don't you check on the roast while I wash up? How's that sound? All right. I'll do that. And you, you get a little rest, too, if you can. Sounds like a good idea. See you at dinner. Oh. Well, howdy, son. You crept up on me. You look funny. Do I? You need a towel. Well, by gosh, I sure do. I was just about to dry my face. I was looking for you a while ago. What for? Your mama said you was out in the barn. Yep. Did you have fun? I was looking at the cow. Oh, oh. that's good. That's real good, Anthony, that you were looking at the cow. Now, now, you wouldn't be playing any tricks on your dad, would you? Tricks? I, I mean, well, you remember a year ago when we had the pigs? Oh, yeah. And what happened to the pigs? You remember that, too? I turned them into monsters. Oh, <laughs> doggone if you didn't. Real odd-looking things. They were funny. That's it. Real funny looking. <laughs> but good things, Anthony. Real good things. And it's good that you did that. It's real good. Like tonight. Yeah? It's television night. I'm going to make television for everybody. It'll be real funny. It sure will be. Everybody's looking forward to it, too. Just like they do every week. And then we're going to have the surprise party for Dan Hollis. It'll be so much fun. <laughs> yeah. I can hardly wait. <laughs> so, are, are, are you looking for something? Can I get anything for you now, son? Um, no. Don't you want to play some more? I don't like playing alone all the time. Well, I can understand that. No kids came over to play with me today. Is that right? Not a single one. I wanted someone to play with. Well now, Anthony, you remember the last time some children came over? Mm-hmm. The little Fredericks boy and his sister? I had a real good time. Oh, sure you did. Sure you had a good time. And that's great. Great. It's just that... It's just that what? It's just that you wished them into the cornfield when you didn't like the way they played. That's okay. But I hear their mom and dad were real upset. About what? If you if you wish people away like that, pretty soon there won't be no one left. So maybe next week we'll talk to some of the folks about having their children come over. We'll do that, won't we? Talk about it first. Yeah, and when they come over, I can make some of those funny animals. That's fun, isn't it? That's a lot of fun. That's Bill Soames' collie. Is it? Yep, that's the dog that always comes around. Yeah, that does sound like Bill Soames' dog. Not many dogs left now, Anthony. You wish them all away. I didn't like them. They didn't like me. I hate anybody who doesn't like me. But everybody loves you. They love you, son. You're everybody's favorite. I heard somebody think one time, 
Somebody thought I shouldn't have wished away all the automobiles and things. And the electricity. They said it wasn't good that I did that. Somebody thought it one time. Who? Who thought that? Was it Teddy Reynolds who thought that? He owned the farm up the road. Oh yeah, I remember. He shouldn't have thought those bad thoughts. That's why I made him go on fire. Sure, that was why... That dog, that collie, he doesn't like me. Oh, I don't know about that. He's a bad dog. Well now, Anthony, did you do something to Bill Soames' dog? (laughs) Guess you must have. He isn't outside anymore. I put him in the cornfield. I'm gonna go out in the yard now. Bye. No, no. Bill Soames' collie was out by the tree just now. I heard him barking and then he just... (laughs) Why why Anthony done that? It was a good thing that Anthony done that, wasn't it, honey? Wasn't it a real good thing? Thing? Oh, yes, indeed. It was a real good thing that Anthony did it. Well, I've got to get back and get supper ready. Stay a minute. Ethel's bringing over the candles for Dan's cake. Amy already made it. She got the last box of cane sugar there was to be found. Agnes? The very last box. And Dan hasn't got one single inkling that there's a surprise party for him. Not one. Glad to hear it. And you know how much Dan likes music? Well, last week, Thelma Dunn found a record in her attic. That a fact? Yes, and she's going to give it to him tonight. Isn't that a wonderful surprise? It sure is. A record. Imagine. That's a real nice thing to find. What record is it? Perry Como singing You Are My Sunshine. Well, what do you know? I always like that tune. How did Thelma happen to find it? Oh, you know, just looking around for new things. Or old things. The ones that are still... still left. Say, who has that picture we found a while back? I kind of liked it. That old clipper ship sailing along. The Smiths. Next week, the Sippiches get it, and they give the Smiths the old McIntyre music box. And we give the Sippiches... I know, I know. That's the way of things now. There's... So little left. But that's okay, isn't it? Everybody keeps a few things for a while, and then they trade off. There's about three books left, and each family... Oh, now, honey. And each family can keep it for a week, and then trade it for something else. Like with the stereoscope the Van Neusens found in their cellar. Or the can of beer that Bill Soames found wedged into an old icebox in the junkyard. I'd better go check on the kitchen. You see, the thing of it is, Anthony, Anthony fixed it so that we're alone in the world. Nothing new ever gets built anymore. Nothing new at all. That's enough. No, it's not nearly enough. Remember six years ago, old Doc Baker, rest his soul, he took one look at Anthony when he was born, and he screamed and dropped him. Tried to kill him right then and there. He knew. Somehow he knew what Anthony was, and he thought it would have been better if he had been born dead. But Anthony, my my son, he whined and let out a cry, and then he done this thing. He took his revenge. Oh, didn't he? Please, please, I beg of you, don't. No. And 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 he he either destroyed the world and only left this village, or he took the village someplace away from everything. We don't know exactly which, do we? All we know is that we're alone, and there aren't any towns or villages or anything else left except this place. And Anthony, he controls it with his mind. He controls everything. That's right. That little boy in the yard outside. He can make it rain or snow. He can wish people into a grave. Or he can turn them into into, into anything he wants. That's why you got to keep smiling or laughing. Or you got to mumble something to keep your mind clear. Because Anthony, Anthony can tell what you're thinking. And if it's a bad thought, his mind will snap at you and he'd do most anything. Most anything at all. Please, for the love of God! (laughs) Mom? Dad? 
right. All right. <clears throat> but it's good. It's good that it turned out this way, isn't it? It's real good. That's what it is. Really, really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. oh, poor Rocco. And now, the bird and the BB gun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Will you look at that? What, Ethel? It's just like cartoons, only better. And last but not least, the turtle crossing the street. And now, time for our next program. <laughs> Welcome, horror fans, to tonight's episode of Scary Nightmares. <laughs> this one's a real killer of a story. <laughs> it's called Pleasant Dreams. Let's watch, shall we? Think I'll go get some fresh air. Shh. Not now, Dan. <laughs> That's all the TV there is. Oh, that was wonderful, Anthony. Wasn't it, everyone? Wasn't Anthony's television wonderful? Yeah, just wonderful. Even better than last week. Yeah, great. It was much better than the old television. Oh, the best yet. You can say that again. You'll have to come around next week. Oh, I will. I will. And now, everyone, is it time? I guess so, honey. The surprise for Dan's birthday. Oh, you shouldn't have done anything. Go ahead, Ethel. Give your hubby the big surprise. All right. Here you go, Dan. I, I wrapped it for you special. What's this? O open it. Yeah, go ahead. Well, if you say so. I hope you like it. What's this, a record? It's Perry Como. A real collector's item, you might say. No kidding. I haven't heard Perry Como in years and years. Such a great crooner. You know what a crooner is, don't you, son? No. It's a singer. Someone who sings the old songs. What a great voice he had. Oh, didn't he? Happy birthday, darling. Happy birthday. <laughs> hey, you better not hug me too hard. I'm holding a priceless object here. You certainly are. Wow. Do you think we could play it? You mean right now? I'd love to hear some new music. Well... What I'd like to hear is the first part, just the orchestra part, before Como sings. Would that be all right? I don't like singing. <clears throat> I don't think we'd better, Dan. After all, we don't know where the singing comes in. It would be taking too much of a chance. Better wait till you get home. Put it on the table for now. But we don't have a Victrola at home. That's all right. Better to keep it safe. These old records break so easily. I guess you're right. Of course I am. There. It's good that I can't play it here. And now I think it's time for Pat Riley to play some piano for us. How about it, Pat? Would you? That's a great idea. Well, then, it'd be my pleasure. Move right in, Anthony, so you can watch him. It's great what he can do with those fingers of his. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. Oh, don't be. You play beautifully. Okay, then. Here it goes. Uh, guess I'm out of practice. <laughs> It'd be good if you told me what to play, Anthony. It'd be real good if you tell me what music you like. Just play. Play anything. All right. Um, I'll play um, Night and Day. That's a nice old tune. It sure is. That's always lovely. Yeah, go ahead.
What are you doing? What does it look like, having another brandy? You've had enough. Not hardly. Stop it. Leave me alone. Put the glass down. Take your hands. Don't make any noise. I don't like noise when the music is playing. I'll drink to that. Oh, don't worry. I'll clean it up. Go on, Riley. Finish the song. Yes, yes, please. It's so pretty. <laughs> pretty, all right. Dan, please. Please what? I'm not doing anything. No, darling. But... I'm just drinking this peach brandy on my birthday. That's all I'm doing. Please, Dan. For the love of heaven, please don't say anything else. Who's saying anything? I'm not saying anything. I'm listening. Shh. Play it, Pat. This is real good brandy. Real good. You people know something? There's only five bottles of real liquor in the whole village. Five. One rye, two scotch, one after-dinner cordial, and this here. And when that's gone, there won't be any left at all. None. Keep playing. Nuts. Nuts! Can't even play my record. Can't even play Perry Como. Don't play that anymore, Pat. That's not what I want you to play. Play this. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. Dan! Happy... Please, stop! Oh, please, Ethel, be quiet! Dan! <laughs> Ethel, you have to stop now. Happy birthday, dear Danny. Happy birthday to me. Play it, Pat. Play it so I can sing it right. You know, I can't carry a tune unless somebody plays it. I'll do my best. That's enough. I said, that's enough! Go outside for a while, Dan. Get a breath of fresh air. You! You and her! You had them! You had to go have them, didn't you? If there's any fault, it's yours! You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when I am blue. You monster. You dirty little monster. You murderer. Hey, what you thinking, Anthony? You go ahead. You think about me. You think bad thoughts about me. And maybe some man in this room. Some man with guts. Somebody who's sick to death of living in this place and is willing to take a chance. Maybe he'll sneak up behind you and lay something heavy across your skull and end this once and for all. You're a bad man. You think that, Anthony. You go ahead. I'm a bad man. Keep thinking that. Somebody get behind him. That's all it takes. Somebody end this now. Pick up a, a bottle or a stick or something, anything, and... You're a very bad man, and you keep thinking bad thoughts about me. But now you can't anymore. You can't even see me. My eyes? Your eyes aren't real. They're like a toy. That's all you are now. A toy jack-in-the-box. Anthony, push it away. And push it into the cornfield. We've all looked at it enough. Please, son. Push it into the cornfield. All right. That's better. He was a bad man, so I turned him into a clown jack-in-the-box. A clown that still had his face. You shouldn't think bad thoughts either, lady, or I'll do the same thing to you. It's a good thing you did that to Dan. It's a very good thing. Play some more music, Mr. Riley. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was swell. Just swell. A real good thing. I like that song. Come on, Anthony. I'll lift you up so you can sit on the piano. Would you like that? You know something. What's that, Amy? Careful. Watch your step. Why don't you sit down again? I kind of liked it a little bit better when there were cities outside. 
and we could get real television and radio and things like that? Didn't you? Why, Amy, it, it's good for you to say such a thing. Very good, but you must be making a joke. Anthony's television is much better than anything we ever used to get. Oh, yes. It's fine. It's fine. Anthony's are the best shows we've ever had. Look at that, will you? It's snowing outside. Anthony, are you making it snow? Yeah, I'm making it snow. I like snow. So do I. We all do. But that'll kill off half the crops. That's what it'll do, Anthony. And then we won't have anything to harvest or eat. Did you know that? Mm-hmm. But I guess it's good that you're making it snow. It's real good. And tomorrow, tomorrow will be a good day, no matter what. A very, very good day. No profound comment here. No clever words about the human mind and the power of thought or the need to survive. We only wanted to introduce you to one of our favorite citizens, and we do mean favorite, little Anthony Fremont, age six, who lives in a village called Peaksville, in a place that used to be Ohio. And if by some strange chance you should ever run across him, you'd best think only good thoughts, because anything less than that is attempted at your own risk. In the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Scattered low clouds in the a.m., clearing by early afternoon and followed by some sunshine. I'm waiting, Henry. In a minute, Mama. Barley's going to be on the news. Henry, come in the kitchen right now. One more minute. And in sports, here's a flash from the past. One of the city's favorite sons is set for an important boxing match tonight at St. Nick's Arena. Mama, come here. What is it? Quick. For this battling middleweight, tonight's the night, the one that counts. I thought you were going to help me with the dishes. Look! Henry, I need you now. Look! Why, that's a picture of Bowley. But after such a checkered career, can he make a comeback? I know. To put it another way, is this bout really necessary? No fighter lasts forever, and sports fans don't want to see a good man take a beating in the ring. So here's this reporter's advice to Bully Jackson. It's time to pack it in. Find another line of work if you have to, but 
take care of yourself and stay out of the game. Get a job behind the scenes, training younger, stronger, talented young bloods whose careers are ahead instead of behind them. Now. Yes, Mama. You're a good boy, Henry, but you gotta learn. Don't get your hopes up too high or you'll... Where are you going now? I gotta see Bowen. Leave him alone. He must be busy getting ready. But he needs me. Listen to me, Henry. Some things you just can't wish for. They're too big. You just set yourself up for a big disappointment. Please. He's my friend. Well, just for a second. But don't you get in his way now. I won't. In and out of the ring, it's been up and down. After a string of early victories, he found it hard to keep getting up again and again. So read the handwriting on the wall. Don't get hurt this time, champ. You proved you could do it. Now it's time to step aside. Oh, Bully, please, please listen to the man. In this corner of the universe, a prize fighter named Bully Jackson. 183 pounds, a little over his best weight, and an hour and a half away from his chance for a comeback at St. Nick's Arena. Mr. Bowley Jackson, who now lives in a tenement building and by the standards of his profession is an aging, over-the-hill relic of what was, and who now sees a reflection in his dresser mirror of a man who left too many pieces of his youth in too many stadiums for too many years before too many screaming people. Mr. Bowley Jackson, who might do well to look for some gentle magic in the hard-surfaced glass that stares back at him from somewhere in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Big Tall Wish, starring Blair Underwood, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Hey, Bowley! You in there? Uh... Henry, what you doing here? Want to help you get ready for the fight. Can I? Yeah, sure you can. We're friends, aren't we? Come on in. Okay. Go on, sit down on the bed while I finish packing my gear. You feeling good, Bully? You feeling sharp? Take a tiger tonight, huh, Bully? Take a tiger, Henry. Gonna take me a tiger? Show me how you're gonna do it. You know, left, right, and one in the stomach... Bow! Just like that. Yeah! Then lift him up by the tail. Oh. And then what? And throw him all the way out to the ninth row. Looking at yourself in the mirror, huh? Yeah, you're looking good, Bully. You're looking sharp. You gonna watch it on TV? You fooling? I'll yell so loud, you'll hear me all the way to St. Nick's. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know what I see in the mirror? A fighter don't need a scrapbook, Henry. You want to know about what he's done, where he's been? You can read it right in his face. He's got the whole story right there, cut into his skin. Yeah. Well, where'd you get that scar anyway? Which one? Over your eye. Ah, that's St. Louis. Guy named Sailor Lovett. Real fast boy. And see this nose? That was Memorial Stadium, Syracuse, New York. Italian boy. Fought like Henry Armstrong, all hands and arms, just like a windmill all over you. That was the first time I ever had my nose broke twice in one fight. Did it hurt bad? Sure it did. What you think? Gee, Bully, that's tough. Moving south, Henry, moving south. Now, this ear, Miami, Florida. Boy got me up against a ring post, did this here, with his laces on the face. That's where you read it. Start at the first match and move across Pittsburgh, Boston, Syracuse. I'm a tired old man, Henry. Tired old man trying to catch a bus. But the bus already gone. Left a couple of years ago. Aw, oh, that ain't true. Here, look for yourself. Hands all heavy. Legs all rubbery. Short breath. One eye not so good and... 
There I go running down the street trying to catch this bus to glory. Stop talking like that. I'm only telling the truth. Bowley, you're going to catch a tiger tonight. I'm sure going to try. I know you are, because I'm going to make a wish. I'm going to make a big, tall wish. And you ain't going to get hurt none either. I'm going to make a wish that you don't. You hear? I don't want you getting hurt. You've been hurt enough already, and you're my friend, Bowley. You're my good and close friend. You are a good boy, Henry. Good boy. And I thank you. Yeah. Nah, you go on. I gotta get my gym back packed. I'll wait and walk you downstairs. Okay, boy. Okay, okay. I like that just fine. There you are, Henry. Hi, Mama. Where did you run off to? I'm helping Bowling. Well, don't get in his way. You got quite a boy there, Francis. Quite a boy. I hope he didn't bother you too much. Him? No, no. He, he talks like a little old man sometimes, you know. Real intense. Says I'm his good and close friend. Well, you are. You know, he's mine too. I don't think I ever had a friend like Henry. You're good to him, Bowley. You're real good to him. Taking him to ball games all the time, taking him out for walks. Hard for a boy not to have a father around. He never did know his. I know he didn't. He won't be going to bed tonight till you get back. Uh, don't let him stay up too late. Take care of yourself, Bowley. I hope I hope you don't get hurt none. I'll work hard on it. I'm going to make a wish, Bowley. I'm going to make a wish nothing happens to you. So don't you be afraid, understand? Don't you be afraid, no matter what. Because nothing can hurt you. You hear me? Nothing. That boy. You're more than his friend, Bowley. He's got you in a shrine. Why would he do that? Because you deserve it. Scared old man who don't remember nothing except how to bleed. I don't fit in no shrine, Francis. Don't talk like that. But you tell him. You tell him how I'm obliged for his wish. I think he already knows. Because that's what I need right now. Just a little magic. He's been talking about making a wish all day. Has he? He's all the time making wishes, Bowley. I see him standing there in the bedroom in the dark, looking out of the window. I come in real quiet and I say, Henry, why don't you go to sleep? And he turns around with that serious little face of his and he says, Making a wish, Mama. Making a wish for this, making a wish for that. Oh, he's all the time wishing. Why, just the other night. What? Oh, it was nothing. Tell me. Well, I needed some more money for the rent. Fifty dollars. Henry said he was going to make the big, tall wish. That's his biggest kind, the big, tall wish. He don't waste it on just anything. It's what he calls the most important one. That was last Friday. And then what do you know? A woman I did some nursing for out on the island sent me a check. Just like that. A check for fifty dollars. And that was exactly how much I needed. I was real lucky. Yeah, that's what it was. Luck. Little boys are something, huh? Yes, they are. Little boys with their heads full up with dreams. And then... When does it happen, Francis? What do you mean? When do they suddenly know there ain't any magic? When does somebody push their face down on the sidewalk and say to them, Hey, little boy, it's concrete. That's what the world is made out of. Concrete and gutters and dirty old buildings and tears for every minute you're alive. Oh, bully. When do they find out that you can wish your whole life away? But sometimes, what we wish for, it can come true. You know that part too, don't you? I know I'm all wished out. That's the only thing I know for sure. Good luck tonight, Bowley. We'll be waiting for you. Sure, I appreciate it. You kiss him goodnight for me now, if it gets too late. I will. Hey, Bowley, knock him out for me. Yeah, no TKO. Out cold. I got a bet down on you. That <laughs> no good, bum. I thank y'all sincerely. You folks are good neighbors. Bowley, we all know you're the best. 
Well, just don't bet too much now. Why not? You're gonna beat him, aren't you? Yeah, which round? Wanna call it? How about the first round? Put him out of his misery. I'll do the best I can, boys. Best I can. Hey, Joe. There you are, Jackson. What's happening? What you standing back here for? You're supposed to be getting ready. Just checking out the house. Well, forget about it. Thomas won't cut you a piece of the action. Not tonight. How come? Not much box office. Too many people at home watching on TV. So all you get's the guarantee. Ah, that's all right. Just wanted to check it out. Been a while. Yeah, a while. But it's always the same. Cigars, beer, hot dogs, sweat, canvas. Never forget places like this, the way they smell. All this time, I guess I missed it. Go on in the dressing room. In a minute. I'll give you a rub down. We got time. Something wrong, Jackson? Like what? You're not freezing up on me. I'm here, aren't I? I've been working out all month. No offense. I just thought, seeing as how you've been away for a while. Don't talk down to me, Joe. You might have a slight case of the jitters, that's all. Not me. Never did. Never will. Don't worry about it. You'll do fine. Sure I will. You look good. You really do. How was the weigh-in, Slugger? Right on the money. Like I said, you're looking real good. He didn't last long. He never does anymore. Slug him alone. Never could take a punch. That's why he's on the mid-card. Ever since you put him away in Philly. That was a long time ago. Longer for him. How's that boy I got tonight? Nothing much. He still don't know what he's doing. All over the place. Still pretty young. Yeah, he's just a kid. <laughs> Better take it easy on him. Never see that left jab coming. All right, stand back. Let him through. How you doing, Malone? That you, Baldy? Yeah, it's me. Hey, man. Saw the fight. Sorry about that. You did all right. Stayed on your feet. Let me see that eye. Get away from my boy, Jackson. He's hurt. It tagged me pretty good. Eh, it's not too bad. Clean cut. It kind of heals up fast. Come on, Malone. Hold up. Slugger. You're gonna be okay. You hear me? Hey, Bully. Where you been anyway? I ain't seen you around. Ah, here and there. You know how it is. Yeah, I know. You just take it easy for a while. Be good as new. You'll see. You still got that left jab? Sure I do. You sure, Bully? I got a bet down on you. Well, I was gonna, but I... That's Ghost Slugger. I see him alone. Yeah, I see in the funny papers. Move it. Hey, Bully, when you gonna give me a rematch, huh? Anytime, Slugger. Anytime. He was never that much. He did the best he could. All he can do. Yeah, well, you better lace him up now. Sure, Joe. Thomas will be waiting. I bet he will. It's almost showtime. Hurry up, Mazel. I got it. There, Bully. Your hands are taped real good, just like old times. How's it feel? Feels okay. Feels good, Joe. Sure it does. Nice and tight, the way I like it. Ready? I'm ready. What did I tell you? He's all ready, Thomas. Uh-huh. Put out that cigar, will you? What do you care? I gotta breathe in here. Well, you hired me to rep you for the night, Bowley. It's a package deal. Me and the cigar. I told you to butt it out. Yeah, maybe you can back that up. Maybe not. You no, know, maybe. Give it to me. Yeah, you got attitude. I'll say that for you. I like that in my boys. This one here, <laughs> he's a pretty feisty old man. He ain't old. You know what I think? The older they are, the louder they talk. And the more they want, the less chance they got to get it. How'd I get you tonight, Bully? Just lucky, I guess. I'm a bargain, Bully. I'm the expert on has-beens. I've seen your boys. Have you? Catchers, aren't they? All of them. Guaranteed two rounds each. Shovel them in, shovel them out. 
and sew them back together for the next time. <laughs> that's the way to do it, if that's all you got to work with. He don't mean nothing, Thomas. Maybe I do. Month or so from now, Bowling, maybe I'll sign you at the back door. That's what you think? Well, why not? You're long gone. You've had it. Wait till after tonight. You'll want to get in the stable, too. That's right. All you have to do is guarantee two rounds. Two! Three prelims every month. Do that standing on your head, can't you? I thought the smell came with the cigar, but you wear it all over you, Thomas. You know something? You stink. Mm-hmm. You tell him, champ. Let's see if you can do it in the ring. Jackson, ten minutes! Yeah, he'll be there. I pulled you for a manager this time. Well, just lucky, I guess. So let's see if you can do your job. Now, what about tonight? What about tonight? Better sit down and lace him up. What should I look out for? <laughs> you serious? I only seen this boy fight once. That was a couple of years ago. I could say. No? I ain't never seen him. Are you sure? I'm sure. What about it, Joe? That's true? Well, uh, I don't know. You've watched him fight, all right. Hey, let go of me. A matter of fact, you've seen him six times in the past year. I keep up, see? Hey, hey, you're imagining things. You are a piece of garbage, Thomas. You're betting on him, aren't you? Aren't you? You got a mouth on you, Jackson, you know that? Yeah, you think so? Holy, oh, what are you doing? You better listen to Joe. It ain't enough he sells wrecks by the pound. He comes in here for some dirty money, supposed to help me, and then he bets on the other guy. I may be a bum upstairs in another ten minutes, but I'm gonna fight a beautiful first round in here. Hey, hey, you touch me again, I'll have you up for ten years. Yeah? Yeah, I swear to you, Boldy, I'll fix your wagon good. Lay off me, Bowley! You're digging your own grave, you crummy tanker! Bowley, please, don't hit him again! Ugh. You just got lucky you hit the wall instead of me that time! Bowley, your hand! See you later, Jackson. Let me see it. Aw, oh, man, what'd you go and do that for? Don't worry about me. It wasn't enough you had to spot him all those years. It wasn't enough, huh? Now you gotta walk in with four busted knuckles. Oh, you're bleeding right through the tape. So what? You've seen blood before? I'll put a bandage on it. Leave it. Bowley, come here. I don't care, Joe. Somebody's gotta teach that lowlife a lesson. Maybe so. Maybe. But not you. Not tonight. Okay, Jackson, you're on. Well? Well, nothing. Let's do it. You sure, Bowley? Give me my gloves. Right here. Ah, uh, careful. Poor little Henry. Who? I put two strikes on his magic already. What are you talking about? Nothing, nothing, Joe. It don't matter. Because he's got to learn. Who's got to learn? This friend of mine, his name... Henry Temple. He's got to learn that there ain't no such thing as magic. anymore, Henry. Stop it! Please, turn it off now. He's down! Jackson is down! It's as good as over! Henry, do you hear me? Get away from the TV. Please, Bowley! What are you doing? Simmons 
is out. One of the most amazing turnarounds we've ever seen. Foley Jackson was as good as gone, but then somehow he reached way, way down, sucked it up, and landed a left jab in a combination that put the lights out for Simmons, the favorite. Ladies and gentlemen, Foley Jackson has done it. He's back. It's all over, Bowley. I'm sorry, Joe. What are you sorry for? For letting you down. You did it! Who? You did! Did? Did what? Knocked him clean out! You sure? Look at him! Where? Hey, drag that bum out of here! Which bum? Simmons! Get an ambulance while you're at it! He ain't going nowhere! Joe, I, th I think I blacked out. I don't, I don't know what happened. Well, I do. Everybody saw it. You put the old one-two on him, but good. Way to go, champ. Knew you could do it. Way to go. Joe, my, my hand. My hand. Is it broke? No, it, it, it don't even hurt. <laughs> then raise it up. And the winner, by knockout, at 123 in the second round, our own boy. Only put on your robe and let's go. Take a shower and get dressed. We got some celebrating to do. Something's not right about this, Joe. What do you mean? I, I don't know what it is. But something is just... Something's not right about this. How do I look, Joe? Like a million bucks. You didn't need a shower, never even worked up a sweat. <laughs> Look in the mirror, not a mark on you. Oh, you're beautiful, Bowley. Yeah, but he kept on hitting me and hitting me. When? All through the first round and the second. But you was bobbing and weaving. He never laid a glove on you. You positive? Yep, you done dandy. Joe, look at this hand. My fingers are fine. They sure are. You were wrong, huh? I just bruised it, I guess. It hurt like anything, but somebody said, I got him with it full on. It couldn't have been broken after all. Who said it was? You did, and it, and it felt like it too. I could feel the knuckles coming up through the bandage. I don't know, I, I could have sworn it was busted. And when he knocked me down... What? He did what? Knocked me down, Joe. When he knocked me down, I, I don't even remember getting up. And the next thing I knew, there was Simmons laying on his back. Well, then you and me, we was in different arenas tonight. What are you saying? You didn't get knocked down, Bowley. You was never off your feet. I wasn't? No, you sure wasn't. This one you carried all the way, baby, just like the old days. Who's that? Your fans. Who'd you think? I don't believe you. You want I should open the door and let him in? Hey, Jackson, show us how you did it. What a job. What a right. I knew he could. Bowley, when you gonna fight again? Hey, you gonna get a title shot. How about a picture? Wait, Joe, close the door. Just a minute, folks. The champ will be right out. Let me get this straight. What's to get? You hear that bunch? Enjoy it. I wasn't off my feet. Nope. I didn't go down. Not once. Would I lie to you? All these years, you ever know me to lie to you? No. Then what are you waiting for? Let's go and paint the town red. No, I, I, I don't know, Joe. There's something I gotta do. Like what? Well, I sort of promised somebody I'd see him later after the fight. You don't mind if I have a good time, do you? Nah, of course not, Joe. <laughs> You're entitled. Just remember me to all the guys, okay? Maybe I'll hook up with you later. You got it. Good night, old timer. Just remember, I'm real proud of you. Hey, there he is. Beautiful, Bully. I watched the whole thing. Didn't take long. Second round. Thank you. Oh, you were great, Bowley. We seen you on the television. You was really great. Just beautiful. Let me feel your muscles. Wow, you clobbered him good. That was a real right hand. Where'd you get a right hand like that? You know something? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I really don't know. Ha, yeah, he don't know. Thank you all. I gotta get inside now. Somebody I want to see. Francis, I just wondered if... You should have seen him, Bowley. He liked to went out of his mind. He was so happy. Whole building was shaking. You'd never believe it. 
Is he... He's up on the roof, waiting for you. I'll see to him. Send him down soon, Bolly. It's real late. Bolly! What do you say, Henry Temple? Come here and give me a hug. You were a tiger, Bolly. You were a real tiger. Look okay? Sharp. Sharp like a champ. You was Armstrong and Lewis and Ali and everybody all wrapped up into one. Oh, <laughs> well, hey, 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 you know something? That boy must have hit me so hard, he knocked the hurt right out of me. How come? Because, Henry, I don't remember a doggone thing. I mean, I must have really been punchy for a second because I thought he had me on my back. And there I was, I was looking up at that old ref waving his arm down on me, and I was staring up at the light blinking my eyes, and... It must have been some kind of dream or something. I don't know nothing about that. Henry, I was never off my feet. I never got knocked down. That right? I gotta go. Henry, look at me, boy. Look at me. I was never off my feet. Say it. Am I your true friend? Yeah. Friends don't tell lies to each other. Now tell the truth. Henry, I'm asking you, was I laying on my back and on the way out? Y yes. But nobody remembers it. Nobody at all except me. I thought it happened, but it didn't. I thought I was laying there on my back getting counted out, but everybody tells me. Bowley, I made the big wish then. I had to make the big wish. I wish you were never knocked down. I just shut my eyes and I... And I wish real hard. It was magic, Bowley. We had to have magic right then. No. Oh, no. Had to, Bowley. Nothing left for us then. Had to make a wish. Crazy kid. Don't you know there ain't no magic? Bowley, you're hurting me. There ain't no magic or wishing or nothing like that. You're too big to believe in fairy tales. If you wish hard enough, Bowley, it'll come true. If you wish hard enough and then believe it, it'll stay that way. Somebody's got to knock it out of you, don't they? Somebody's got to take you by the hair and rub your face in the world and give you a taste and smell of the way things are, don't they? Stop! Listen, boy, I've been wishing all my life. You understand, Henry? You understand? I got a gut ache from wishing, and all I got to show for it is a face full of scars and a head full of memories of all the hurt and all the misery I've had to eat with and sleep with my whole miserable life. Oh, you crazy kid. I'm not. Crazy, crazy kid. You, you, you telling me you wished me into a knockout? You telling me it was magic that they got me off my back? Uh, now, listen, boy. There ain't no magic, huh? No magic, Henry. I had that fight coming and going. I had it in my pocket, man. I was the number one out there, and there ain't no such thing as magic. Bully, if you believe, understand? You've got to believe. If you don't believe, Bully, it won't be true. That's the way magic works, Bully. You got to believe. Please, please believe. Little nutcase. That's what you are. How come I got mixed up with you? Ain't I got enough trouble without getting mixed up with some dopey kid that... <laughs> oh, God. Sorry, Henry. Henry, come here, come here, come here. Henry, look at me. I can't believe. I'm too old and I'm too hurt to believe. I, I can't, boy. I just can't. Henry. Henry, there ain't no such thing as magic. God help us both. I wish there were. Bully, you got to believe. I can't. You got to. Bully, you got to believe. Or else... I told you. I can't. Then if you can't, Bully, if you can't... Come on, Jackson. I'll help you up. 
Oh. What happened? Ah, the kid got in a lucky punch. Don't worry about it. Don't mean nothing. You should have stayed in bed, Bully. How come you didn't use your jab and you're right? I broke my hand, that's why. He do that to you? No, nah, no, nah, I did it to myself. It was a it was an accident. Oh man, Bully, are you kidding me? You ought to pack it in, Bully. Get yourself a real job. Excuse me, I I gotta go in. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah. I'm okay. I was afraid you got hurt. Me? No, 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 I'm too tough for that. You sure? Let me see. Oh, Bowley, that's a bad cut right there. And those bruises? Let me clean it up for you. Maybe later. Where's Henry? He's in bed, Bowley. I, I have to tell you, that's a sad little boy in there. Can I see him? Sure, I expect he's waiting for you. Bowley? Yeah? I'm real sorry. I know you are, Francis. Me too. Henry, you're not talking to me? Sure I am. Uh, I pulled a rock, Henry. Threw a punch before I should have. Hit the wall. See, I, I busted my knuckles. And I went in with half my artillery gone. You still look like a tiger. You look like a real tiger. I was proud of you. I was real proud. That's good. I better go now. Night, Henry. Bowley? You go to sleep. Tomorrow we'll go to the hockey game and we'll get some hot dogs in the park. Just just you and me. Sure thing, Bowley. That'll be great. And Bowley, I ain't gonna make no more wishes. I'm too old for wishes. There ain't no such thing as magic. Is there? No, I guess not, Henry. Or maybe, maybe... Hey, maybe there is magic. Maybe there's wishes, too. I don't know. I guess the trouble is... I guess the trouble is... There's just not enough people around to believe. Hey. Good night, boy. Good night, Bowley. Mr. Bowley Jackson, who shares the most common ailment of all men, the strange and perverse disinclination to believe in a miracle, the kind of miracle to come from the mind of a little boy, and now perhaps only to be found in the Twilight Zone. We'll be back to the Twilight Zone after these brief messages. traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. He's dead. Get him down. Yes, Captain. Clemens, what the devil do you think you're doing? Uh, uh, cutting him down, Captain. This is the last of the rope, Clemens. There's still one more to go. Just untie him. For pity's sake, catch him before he falls into the river. Traitor or not, he deserves a decent burial. Captain... The rope's looking pretty f frayed. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure it'll take the weight of another prisoner. It'll have to. But, Captain... I said it'll have to! Yes, sir.
You have just witnessed a military execution. Death is a dignitary who, when he comes announced, is to be received with formal manifestations of respect, even by those most familiar with him. This particular execution occurred on Owl Creek Bridge in northern Alabama during the war between the states. You might find it in the works of that past master of the incredible Ambrose Bierce, but its proper home is in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, starring Christian Stolte, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Hurry up, Clemens. I want to get this last one hanged while it's still daylight. Almost got him, Captain. Friends are dead, Peyton. That's your name, isn't it? Mr. Peyton Farquhar? Your act of treachery came to nothing, Peyton. And now you'll be called to account. I wouldn't recommend you think of doing anything as stupid as trying to get off this bridge. Apart from the fact that your wrists are tied behind your back. You'll find yourself more than adequately surrounded, whichever way you choose to run. See those sentinels at either end? Please don't get the impression they're just taking a rest. The way they're holding their rifles, they call that the support position. Means they're always at the ready. As a good soldier, the Federal Army should be. <clears throat> Don't say too much, do you? Huh? Peyton? Peyton Farquhar. Hello? Anybody at home? And here I thought you were a true southern gentleman. I know what you're thinking, Peyton. That maybe you can make that 20-foot drop into the water. And who knows, maybe you're good at that. But after that, your chances for continued survival become pretty slim. Look over there on the bank of the stream, you know what that is? It's the muscle of a cannon. You see, there's an outpost near here. If you really squint, you can see a company of infantry at parade rest. Think of them as spectators, if you want. But if you sincerely want to swim for it, you might just as well be giving them target practice, which, believe me, they don't really need. You want to leave your wife a pretty-looking corpse, don't you? Hmm? Still not in the mood for talking, huh? Well, I can understand that, time like this. A man needs to get his thoughts in order and ready himself for, you know... Perhaps I can help you with that. From a purely practical standpoint, I mean. I'm not a priest or anything like that. Truth to tell, my knowledge of matters theological doesn't amount to very much at all. But I can tell you a little bit about how it'll happen. Me and Clements will escort you out to the center of the bridge. Then introduce you to Captain Newman. He's a nice man. You'll like him. Me and Clemens salute the captain, then we stand behind him, leaving you face to face with the sergeant. Now, he's not such a nice man, sorry to say, but, oh, I forgot. You two have already met. Well, when the moment comes, you'll both be standing on opposite ends of the same plank. He stands on the safe end, but you probably already guessed that. And you probably guessed that it's his job to hold the plank in place. Then, when the captain feels the time is right, right for him, not for you, he gives a signal to the sergeant. 
The sergeant steps aside, the plank tilts, and down you go. <laughs> nah, never having been hanged myself, I can't give you any information on what your final moments on this earth might feel like. But I can tell you, I've seen more than a few of these. And I'm sorry to have to tell you, it doesn't look any too pleasant. Anything to say about that? Well... Well... I am a living man. How's that? Speak up, Peyton. If you got any famous last words, we should hear them. Otherwise, they won't be famous. I am a living man! <laughs> not for much longer. <laughs> no, sir, not for much longer. Captain says we're ready for him. Hear that, Peyton? We're ready for you. They say the Lord hates a coward, so take my advice and try and face it with a smile. Why do you have to do that, Levine? Do what? Well, taunt him like that. He shouldn't expect anything better. This is war. He was on the wrong side. The wrong side? Do you think he thinks that? I don't give a damn what goes on inside his head. Neither should you, Clemens. And unless you want to end up with a noose around your neck, don't let anyone else hear you talking like that. Now, help me up with him. Uh. Oh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, my darling, what have I done? What have I done to you and the children? I promised you. Promised I'd come back. What is a man if he's not as good as his word? What am I? Secure the noose! The noose. If only I could free my hands. Perhaps I could throw off the noose. Perhaps I really could dive into the stream. I might evade the bullets, and if I swam vigorously enough, reach the bank. Then take to the woods and get away. Get back home. Yes. Home. And back to you, Elizabeth. Thank God home is outside their lines. My wife and little ones are still beyond the invader's farthest advance. That pounding. What is causing that pounding? It's like the stroke of a blacksmith's hammer on the anvil. Is it distant? Nearby? Or both? Perhaps it's my death knell. Feels like a knife being thrust into my ear. Damn them, what's taking them so long? If you're gonna do it, just do it! Sergeant, step away. Too late. My God, it's too late. Oh, Elizabeth. So, how much further is it? What? Much further to where? Where am I? Your home, Mr. Farquhar. How much further? Uh, a little... A little further. Um, yes, a little further. Just keep along this road. I'm sorry, I'm... I'm somewhat confused. Hardly surprising. You've just woken up. It usually takes me a good half hour and a stiff drink before I know my own name. Say, you wouldn't happen to have a stiff drink on you, would you? I'm afraid not. Mm, too bad. No, oh, wait. I can't... I can't have been sleeping. Why not? Look at me, I'm walking. How could I fall asleep walking? Horses fall asleep standing up. But not walking. 
Well, I don't know about you, but I've got to the end of plenty of days without the faintest idea what I've done. Of course, as I explained to you, Mr. Farquhar, I drink a bit. You know my name. Mm-hmm. You're Mr. Peyton Farquhar. How do you know my name? You told me. I did. Sure you did. Right after I found you on the bank of the river. The bank? The southern bank. When I discovered you, you were digging your fingers into the sand, throwing it over yourself in handfuls, and almost blessing it. That doesn't sound like the sort of thing I'd do. You don't remember? I... No. Well, it's what you did. You said it reminded you of diamonds, rubies, emeralds. I said that. I got the impression there was nothing beautiful you didn't think it resembled. Naturally, I was quite convinced at that moment that you were insane. No offense, sir. Sounds like a very natural reaction. I would have come to the same conclusion. And then you said something that captured my attention. And what was that? Still don't remember? Please, refresh my memory. You said, um, now let me think. This was all good stuff. I don't want to get it wrong. Oh, yes. You noted a definite order in the arrangement of the trees. That a strange, roseate light shone through the spaces among their trunks, and the wind made in their branches the music of aeolian harps. Well, sir, I've been from one end of this great land to the other, and I've met many madmen. Some of them confined for their own good, some of them elected to high office, but never a madman with such a poetic grasp of the language. That was when I knew you were just too interesting to leave where I found you. I do remember. Now it all comes back to you. Not all of it, not yet. But I remember lying on the bank. I was so content there. More than I've ever been in my... Right then and there, I had no wish to perfect my escape. I was happy to remain in that enchanting spot until they recaptured me. Recaptured, eh? You haven't mentioned that before. Of course, you haven't said much of anything since I found you. You're a man on the run, then. Forgive me, miss... I'm sorry I don't seem to be able to recall your name. It'll come to you. Well, no offense, sir, but I'm not sure it would be wise to tell you the details. You're not a trusting man. Of late, I've become somewhat disappointed in human nature. I'm not sure why. This is a new world, Mr. Farquhar. It's understandable that you'd be cautious. But rest assured, I'm not what you might call political. But I do love a good story, if you have one to tell. My story? I have no story. I have a life. A life that's become considerably more interesting of late, I'd venture to say. But beyond your name, I know nothing about you. What manner of man is Peyton Farquhar? Why do you want to know? The road I travel is long and lonely. I'm starved of intelligent conversation, and the only voice I ever hear is my own. Talking to oneself leads inevitably to madness. With you here as my temporary companion, I can stave off that unfortunate condition for at least another day. I see. And tell me, sir, where are you headed? Anywhere I'm welcome and nowhere I'm not. In short, nowhere in particular. So, you were telling me about yourself. <clears throat> Very well. My name is... Peyton Farquhar. Peyton Farquhar. I'm a planter in these parts. A planter, eh? Good to have land. It is. So, I guess you have slaves. Naturally. No need to adopt that tone, Mr. Farquhar. I told you I'm not a political. Just asking. Well, as it happens, I am what you would call a political. The Farquhars are an old and highly respected Alabama family. I'm naturally an original secessionist and ardently devoted to the Southern cause. 
Oh, your memory is reliable when it comes to the matter of who you are, if not where. I suppose so. And yet, if you'll forgive my temerity, for all your patriotic fervor, you clearly didn't take service with the gallant army of the South. May I ask why that was? Circumstances of an imperious nature prevented me from doing so, but I assure you I chafed under the inglorious restraint, longing for the release of my energies, the larger life of the soldier, the opportunity for distinction. And in good faith and without too much qualification, you assent to at least part of the dictum that all's fair in love and war. Are you mocking me by any chance? I would never, ever risk a fellow traveler's friendship for such a trivial gain. Please, continue, I beg of you. I imagine that the opportunity to serve your birthplace came at last, as it comes to all men in wartime. It did. It was one evening, as I was sitting under the magnolia trees near the entrance to my grounds. I was with my wife, Elizabeth. Children were playing nearby. <sighs> this is the life. It surely is, my dear. It surely is. Look at it. It's all so perfect. I'll tell you frankly, Elizabeth, if I should die this very moment, I'd die a happy man. Peyton, darling, I wish you wouldn't say such ghoulish things. I can't bear the thought. I have no fear, Elizabeth. I have no intention of passing away from sheer bliss. I just wanted to make the point that, well, that on such a beautiful evening as this, it's almost impossible to believe there is a war. I wish there weren't. But there must be. Why, Peyton? For them, for the sake of the children. They deserve the best future we can give them. Isn't that worth dying for? I understand that, Peyton. I do. It's just that oh, I sometimes wonder if we couldn't. Peyton, look! That soldier is one of ours. Water. Please. You're exhausted. Peyton, should I fetch one of the slaves? By no means. We'll take care of them ourselves. Get him some water, Elizabeth. Let me help you down, sir. Oh, thank you. You must be starved. Come inside, my man. Oh, this is, uh, this is a splendid meal. Thank you. Some more? Alice, more cornbread. Uh, no, no, please. Uh, this hospitality is far more than I deserve. Nonsense, nonsense. Nothing is too good for our brave boys. Tell me, Corporal, whose command are you with? Uh, Colonel Tolliver, 13th North Carolina. How are things at the front? We hear so little down here. I'm sorry to say things are not going so well. Not so well at all. The Yankees are repairing the railroads in preparation for another advance. They've reached the Owl Creek Bridge. Owl Creek Bridge? Yes, sir. They've put it in order and built a stockade on the north bank. I'm sure you know what that'll mean. Yes. If they can run trains over the bridge, there'll be nothing to stop them. <coughs> Damn, those sons of... <sighs> Forgive me, Elizabeth. You shouldn't be subjected to this manner of talk. Peyton, I understand... Go and see what's keeping Alice with the cornbread. As you wish, my dear. Something on your mind, sir? Corporal, refresh my memory. It's about 30 miles to Owl Creek Bridge? About that. Maybe even a little less. And there's no force on this side of the creek? Only a picket post a half mile out, on the railroad. And a single sentinel at our end of the bridge. Suppose a man, or perhaps several men, civilians and persons of intelligence, 
should elude the picket post and perhaps get the better of the Sentinel. What could they accomplish? Hmm. Accomplish? Well, sir, I was there a month ago. I saw that the flood of last winter lodged a great quantity of driftwood against the wooden pier at this end of the bridge. Driftwood, eh? It's dry now. Exceedingly dry. If someone were to put a light to that driftwood, it'd burn like tow. <laughs> that it would, sir. And that would mean the end of the Owl Creek Bridge. I don't think the Yankees would care for that. Not one damn bit would they care for it. And it goes without saying that such a conflagration would seriously hinder the Northern effort. Oh, it would. But you should know, sir, the Commandant's issued an order declaring that any civilian caught interfering with the railroad, its bridges, tunnels, or trains will be summarily hanged. I I've seen the order. It's posted everywhere. Risk is a part of life, soldier. You face it every day. I do. That I do. And in my own small way, I've done what I can. No service is too humble to perform in the aid of the South. And should the opportunity present itself, no adventure would be too perilous to undertake if consistent with the character of a civilian who is at heart a soldier, of course. Mr. Farquhar? You are a true son of the South, and a very brave gentleman. Elizabeth! I have to go away. Away? For how long, Peyton? Probably just a couple of days. Why? Business. Larson will be going with me, maybe Zella too. I don't know. I'll have to ask him. Peyton, don't go. I don't want you to. The children need you. It's for the sake of the children that I'm doing this, Elizabeth. Why can't you understand that? I do understand. I really do, but I'm afraid. Oh, terrified of losing you. If a man doesn't stand up for what he believes in, then we lose everything. Just promise me one thing. Promise you'll come back to me. I promise. And I'm a man who keeps his promises, my love. Setting fire to the Owl Creek Bridge. Sounds like a most audacious plan. It was. I must confess, Mr. Farquhar, I'm a little confused. How so? You strike me as a competent and determined gentleman. I imagine whatever you want out of life, you get it. That's fair to say. What of it? Simply that I'm surprised your endeavor came to nothing. And what makes you imagine that? <laughs> your present predicament. The absence of your co-conspirators. Those marks upon your neck. And if someone had set the Owl Creek Bridge alight, I'm sure I would have noticed it in some way. Let me check. Where there's smoke, there's fire, and... <laughs> nope. No smoke. You're a very thorough fellow. For a moment, I thought you might know more of my situation than you let on. From the way you talk, do I take it someone in your party betrayed you? Not in my party. But you recall the corporal who appeared at my plantation? Of course. He was a federal scout. Then you were deliberately entrapped. It seems they wanted to weed out the civilians who might cause them some trouble. If I'd only stayed out a little longer that night, I'd probably have seen that same rider repass my plantation, going northward in the direction from which he'd come. From the Owl Creek Bridge? Precisely. And when you and your co-conspirators... Patriots. ...made your assault on the bridge, the military were waiting for you. They made me watch as they hanged my friends for an act of treachery. The sergeant who put them to death was the same man who lured us there. Mm -mm. Is there no honor in conflict? I've never been accused of having much imagination, but I might have guessed it would be something like that. 
I would say, sir, that you have too kindly an expression for one whose neck is in the hemp. It isn't. Isn't what? In the hemp. Of course, of course. What I mean, Mr. Farquhar, is that you are clearly no vulgar assassin. Fortunately, the liberal military code makes provision for hanging many kinds of persons. And gentlemen are not excluded. As they fastened the noose around my neck, I tried to fix my thoughts on my family. But there were so many trivial distractions. The water, touched to gold by the early sun. A piece of dancing driftwood caught in the sluggish current. The brooding mists under the banks some distance down the stream. Then there was a sharp pressure around my throat, followed by a sense of suffocation. Agony shot from my neck downward through every fiber of my body and limbs like streams of pulsating fire heating me to an intolerable temperature. There was no more thought, only sensations. The intellectual part of my nature was effaced. I had power only to feel, and feeling was torment. I was conscious of motion, encompassed in a luminous cloud, of which I was now merely the fiery heart. Without material substance, I swung through unthinkable arcs of oscillation, like a vast pendulum. But you're here. What? What? I said, you're here. Why is that? The rope... It snapped. And I fell into the stream. With a terrible suddenness, the light about me shot upward. There was a loud splash. Then all was cold and dark. My power of thought was restored, and I knew instantly what had happened. And your hands... Were they still bound? They were. Then forgive me, but why didn't you drown? The noose was tight around my neck. It, it, it kept the water from my lungs. And kept you from breathing. When you get into a predicament, sir, you don't do it by half measures. I suppose not. To die of hanging at the bottom of a river. Even at that moment, it seemed ludicrous to me. I opened my eyes in the darkness. I saw above me a, a gleam of light, distant, inaccessible. I was still sinking and the light became fainter and fainter until it was a mere glimmer. Then it began to grow and brighten and I knew I was rising toward the surface. Knew it with reluctance for I was very comfortable. Comfortable? Oh yes. It was a question of preference at that point, you see. To be hanged and drowned, that didn't seem so bad, but to be shot. No, I refused to be shot. It didn't seem fair. I'd say you have a quite singular set of values. Do they offend you? Not at all, not at all. It makes for a more entertaining story, and yours is the most fascinating I've heard in many a year on the road. Please, continue. You're under the water, slowly rising to the surface. Your hands are tied. A sharp pain in my wrists surprised me of the fact that I was trying to free my hands. I gave the struggle my attention as an idler might observe the feet of a juggler without interest in the outcome. Eventually, the cord fell away. My arms parted and floated upward, but I could only dimly make out my hands in the growing light. I watched with a new interest as first one, and then the other pounced upon the noose at my neck. They tore it away and thrust it fiercely aside. Its undulations resembled those of a water snake. And my first thought was to put it back. To put it back? The undoing of the noose had been succeeded by the direst pang that I'd yet experienced. My neck ached horribly, my brain was on fire, my heart gave a great leap and I felt as though it was trying to force itself out of my mouth. 
My whole body was racked and wrenched with an insupportable anguish. And I imagine the desire to rise to the surface was even greater, no matter what you might find waiting for you there. I wanted to stop myself, had to stop myself, but my disobedient hands gave no heed to my command. They beat the water vigorously with quick, downward strokes, forcing me to the surface. I felt my head emerge. My eyes were blinded by the sunlight. My chest expanded convulsively, and with a supreme and crowning agony, my lungs engulfed a great draft of air. So now you were in full possession of your physical senses. If anything, they were more keen and alert than before. I felt the ripples on my face, heard their separate sounds as they struck. I looked at the forest on the bank of the stream, saw the individual trees, the leaves, and the veining of each leaf, saw the very insects upon them, the locusts, the brilliant-bodied flies, the spiders stretching their webs from twig to twig, the prismatic colors in all the dewdrops on a million blades of grass, the humming of the gnats that danced above the eddies of the stream, the beating of the dragonfly's wings. They all made audible music. Remarkable. If you'll forgive my saying so, you missed your life's calling. You have quite a turn for descriptive language. I'm surprised you had the time to note your surroundings in such detail. Uh, it may only have been a few seconds, I'm not really sure. I seem to have lost the ability to judge the passage of time accurately. Or perhaps you've gained a greater appreciation of time. There's a whole world in every second. You have a singular turn of phrase yourself, mister. I'll get it in a minute. No doubt. Did you acquire this philosophical outlook during your travels? Hard to say. See, it often seems like I've been traveling my whole life. But enough about me. I long to hear your story. You've painted a beautiful background for me, but... It strikes me there are more pressing issues in this particular picture. For example, your executioners. My would-be executioners. That goes without saying, surely. Very well. I saw them silhouetted against the blue sky. They shouted, they gesticulated. Their movements were grotesque and horrible. Their forms gigantic. Suddenly, I heard a sharp report as something struck the water smartly within a few inches of my head, spattering my face with spray. One of the officers had his rifle. At his shoulder, there was a light cloud of blue smoke rising from the muzzle. I was surprised he missed. I read somewhere that marksmen with gray eyes are the keenest shots. This fellow was the exception to the rule, it seems. The marksman had gray eyes? Mm-hmm. How could you see that? I'm sorry? He was on the Owl Creek Bridge. You were in the water. And you must have drifted some distance. So, how did you know the marksman had gray eyes? I... don't know how I know. I just... I must have noticed it on the bridge. Just before your execution? My intended execution. As you say. Doubtless the detail was burned into my mind. Doubtless. I told you how much more alive my senses had become at that moment. Alive. Yes, indeed. That you did. That you did. At that moment, a counter-swirl turned me half round. I was looking into the forest on the bank opposite the fort. A clear, high voice rang out and came across the water with a distinctness that pierced and subdued all other sounds, even the beating of the ripples. The voice, what did it say? It said, Attention, company! Ready! Aim! How did you do that? Run! Fire! Oh. 
Are they still behind us? No. No, I don't think so. All right. That's enough for now. No more running for my life. Your what? Wait. I need to get my bearings. I have to know how close I am to my destination. Closer than you think, I'm sure. Eh? Does anything look familiar, Mr. Farquhar? Uh, yes. This way. I think. Yes. This way. Can you see your home? Not yet. But it's not far now. I intend to be back in my wife's arms by close of day. You gave her your word. That I did. And that's important to you. It's a matter of honor. An honor, Mr. Uh, honor means as much as love to a man of the South. A very moving sentiment. Now, where were we? Where were we with what? Your story. My story? Yes. You were just reaching a most exciting point when we were interrupted. I long to know what happened next. Are you quite insane, sir? I don't believe so. But I thought the same of you when I first met you, so I suppose it's a fair question. I am in full possession of all my faculties, Mr... Mr... Everything except the memory, eh? Don't try my patience, sir. I wouldn't dream of it. You ask me an important question, and I'm doing my best to answer it. But you'll appreciate it's difficult to judge these things when one spends so much time alone. If I had a constant companion, someone to tell me if and when I appeared to be losing my senses, that might be helpful, but that's not what fate has in store for me. And as I say... I try to avoid talking to myself because that seems to me the fastest route to madness. But, mad or sane, I know a good tale when I hear it, and yours is the most entertaining I have heard in all my years. Yes, sir, I shall cherish the memory of your experiences when I have long since ceased my wanderings. Please, go on. You'd escape the noose by a most improbable stroke of good fortune, and then you found yourself in the stream and under fire. What was that like? Surely you can imagine that for yourself. We were just under fire a few minutes ago. But not in the water. Well, does it matter? Does to me. It's the setting that makes the crucial difference. Please. Very well. I suppose it might make the journey shorter, at least. Not mine. I dived to avoid the shots dived as deeply as I could. Water roared in my ears like the voice of Niagara, yet still I heard the dull thunder of the volley. Those heightened senses of yours. I rose again towards the surface and was met again by more shining Yankee lead. One shot nicked my cheek, do you see it? I see it. Well, the next time I dove... I was a long time underwater, and I made damn certain I swam farther downstream and nearer to safety. Just as well, since the soldiers had almost finished reloading. The two sentinels positioned at either end of the bridge fired again, independently and ineffectually. I saw all this over my shoulder. I was now swimming vigorously with the current. My brain was as energetic as my arms and legs. I fought with the rapidity of lightning. I reasoned, you see, that the captain had probably already given the command to fire at will. And you surely couldn't dodge all the shots. You're not invulnerable. No man is. Then an appalling splash. Just two yards away was followed by a loud, rushing sound which seemed to travel back through the air to the nearby fort and died in an explosion which stirred the very river to its deeps. A rising sheet of water curved over me, fell down upon me, blinded me, strangled me. The cannon had taken a hand in the game. Did I tell you about the cannon? You must have done. Hmm. Well, anyways, as I shook my head free from the commotion of the smitten water, I heard the deflected shot humming through the air ahead. 
and in an instant, it was cracking and smashing the branches in the forest beyond. I was certain they wouldn't be so far from their target next time, and it was a good gun. The report lagged behind the missile. But surely the smoke would have apprised you of another shot. So long as you kept your eye on the gun, you had a certain advantage, am I correct? You are? The problem was how to reach the shore without turning my back on the cannon. You have my complete attention, sir. How did you manage it? Well, I... don't know. I'm not sure. I felt myself whirled round and round, spinning like a top. The water, the banks, the forest, the distant bridge, fort, and soldiers, they were all somehow commingled, blurred. I could no longer make out objects, only colors. Circular, horizontal streaks of color. It was all I saw. I was caught in a vortex. I felt giddy and sick. Fascinating. Incredible. What is that damned hammering? I don't hear anything. Unless it's the ticking of the watch you can hear. My watch? <laughs> You're lucky it still works after such an immersion. It is my watch. But why should I think... Perhaps you're the sort of man who values the seconds as much as the minutes and the hours. And there's a whole world in a second, so I've been told. So how did you fight your way out of this... this vortex? I really have no idea. The next thing I knew, I was on the road with you at my side, heading for home as I promised. Surely not. I mean, you obviously avoided the cannon and struggled to the bank. Obviously. But I have no memory of it. And of our meeting? I recall only what you told me about it. Most curious. Stop! What is it? This is it. We're here. This is the path to my home. Excellent. Well, I suppose this is where we part company, Mr. Farquhar. May I say, it's been a rare pleasure. You, uh, you wouldn't care to come in? I'm sure the servants could prepare you a meal. That won't be necessary, my friend. I have many miles still to travel. But your journey is almost at an end. Yes. Well, goodbye, Mr... I'm sorry, I thought I could recall your name, but it just escapes me. Call me Ambrose. I wish you well, Ambrose. And you, Mr. Peyton Farquhar. And you. Home. Almost home. How long? How long since that damn imposter rode down this road? How long since I was drawn to the Owl Creek Bridge? I would say, sir, that you have too kindly an expression for one whose neck is in the hem. It is. Is it what? In the hem. Of course, of course. I promised I'd return, Elizabeth. Oh, so perfect. They couldn't keep me from Just you. Just before your execution. My intended execution. As you say. Not even a noose around my neck could stop me from coming back to you, to the family. Now, yes, indeed. I've told you how much more alive my senses have become at that moment. That moment. Alive. Alive. Yes, indeed. I saw them. <laughs> <laughs> John, Elizabeth! don't tease your sister. I want to put on your best behavior when your father returns. Elizabeth! Hey! Elizabeth! You're not getting vulnerable. No man is. Elizabeth! Elizabeth! I swore I'd come back to you. I promised. Hey! Elizabeth! Hey! Elizabeth! Hey! Oh, hey! Hey!
my love. Elizabeth, let me hold you. Let me take you in my arms. There's a whole world in every second. He's dead, Captain. Good work. That's the last execution for today. Get him down! You know, Levine, for a moment there, I, I thought that rope wasn't gonna hold. It's strong enough. It did its job. Do you ever wonder what goes on inside a man's head in those last seconds before death? Like I said before, Clemens, I don't give a damn. And neither should you. An occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, in two forms, as it was dreamed and as it was lived and died. This is the stuff of fantasy, the thread of imagination, the ingredients of the Twilight Zone. An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, starring Christian Stolte with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by M.J. Elliott and based on the short story by Ambrose Bierce. Heard in the cast were Rob Riley, Danny Goldring, William Dick, Susan Hart, Gonzo Schexnader, and John Hoganocker. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced by Carl Lamari and directed by Joe B. Cerny for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design, custom Foley effects, recording, and editing are done in the Cerny American Sound to Picture Theater by sound designers Craig Lee, Todd Beyer, and Tim Cerny. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking.